Thanks for stopping by the Pretty Intense podcast. I am honored and delighted to have a very good friend of mine, Kelly Gores, on the show today. We've been friends since I watched her documentary, Heal, on Netflix a long time ago. I think it might have came out like 2016. And I remember posting something on social media about it on Instagram and tagged her. And she was like, oh, hey, you know, thank you. And we became friends. And and of course, we have the same birthday, so we totally get along. She recently had an explant. Um, of her breast implants and obviously that's something that I just recently did and and me doing it played uh, some part in, in her doing it as well and so uh, today's conversation was the first time she's talked about that publicly and and how it went and why she did it in the first place with getting implants as well as why she got them out the things that she dealt with and what she feels like is better now um, and then we got into some great sort of like philosophical conversation about mental and physical wellness about forgiveness about about men and women, the masculine, feminine. It was a, a just a, a really like well spirited conversation about the things going on in the world and like what the hell we can do about them and what the next steps are. So enjoy the show with Kelly and um, please hit subscribe and the bell for notifications when we have a show come out. And as always, I love to see what you have to say in the comments. I'm really grateful that you wanted to do this interview. I'm grateful that you want to talk about getting your implants out. And I, 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 I really think this is, well, it's, it's actually just came last night from doing an interview for a documentary being made called busted. And, um, so I just, I'm like fresh off of talking about it myself. Um, but what I was telling them is I'm like, it just feels like, cause they've been working, she's been working on it for four years. Wow. And I was like, but if this came out a couple of years ago, I feel like it wouldn't have been as impactful because it feels like right now there's just a lot of talk about it. And um, so anyway, this interview is right on time. The docs are right on time. So uh, I think it's best to, I don't always go in order, um, but I do think that it's appropriate for in the spirit of implants to go back in time to like, just explain like why you did it, you know, like when did you do it and why did you do it? So 12 years ago, I guess, 2010, I had always, I'd never like thought about getting implants, but I'd always been self-conscious of my shoulders. Um, just proportionally, like I was a pretty proportioned kid, but people always commented, you know, are you a swimmer? Your, my, your shoulders are so big. My arms are just big. You know, that was my perception. And, um, and then I was pretty flat. Ultimately, I just wanted to be in proportion. You know, I wanted mm -hmm. to feel like a woman. As I went through this whole journey of making the decision, you know, because you inspired me to do so, which is... So awesome. I was um, thinking back, I was like trying to do the whole healing process of like, what what really got me to do it? I mean, in 2010, it was because I was sick of being out of proportion and I wanted to feel more feminine. But what what was it back in the day? And I remember this boy that I'm still friends with today. He was like my first love. It was in eighth grade, eighth to ninth grade. And he made, I think it was in eighth grade, and he made a comment about how flat I was because everybody around me was, you know, going through puberty. I was a much later bloomer. Mm. And, you know, back, like looking back, it means nothing to me, but I remember being absolutely devastated. Mm. And then, you know, I went, like I went through puberty probably two, three years after most of my girlfriends. And he had a girlfriend at the time who had gone through puberty in eighth grade. And I, she I mean, had big I, boobs and you were like, mm, and, comparison is the thief of joy. Exactly. So joy ripped from me. And then, you know, there was just this subconscious little trauma that I had suppressed. So at the time, I and I, and I was an actor at the time. And so I, I remember telling my surgeon, please, I don't want big boobs. I just want shape. It was more of just like, I was a full B, but I, I, but they were just like, they weren't, they were just not doing anything. They weren't perky. They weren't doing anything. So I was like, I just want a little more shape and to be more proportionate. And so before I went under, I was like, I know you tell me I want more. I don't want more. I'm, I'm blonde. If you give me bigger boobs, I'm going to just be typecast as a bimbo. And that's the end of my career. So, um, so I got really small implants. How small were they? I had 213. That's where mine were. Yeah, I think mine was around that too. That's not big, right? No, mm -mm, no. no it, most most don't go much under 300. Yeah, I think mine was like somewhere like 
210 to 220. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's pretty small. So you had the same set. So you only ever had one set. Only had one set, 12 years. I remember someone okay. telling, they were silicone. Uh -huh. This is before the FDA banned silicone? Or I did guess. you somehow get silicone? I can't remember the years, but they did remember when they banned silicone for a while because it wasn't, it wasn't, uh, it was banned because it was an un it was unhealthy. And I I remember thinking even myself, I'm like, oh, that's stupid. Somebody obviously won in some like money war battle. Like, yeah, I don't know. I just remember people saying silicone was softer, and I yeah. wanted really natural. Yeah. And even though I was like healthy minded at the time, not like I am today. Um, it was still about aesthetic for me. So I, I was just like, I don't care if saline's safer. I want I want them to feel real. Did you even know silicone to be unsafe? I knew there were risks. I knew that there were, if if it if they leaked into your body that you could have some toxic reaction and you didn't want them to leak. And that's why this is like the, the basic due diligence that I did. Um, silicone has more risk than saline because if the, somehow they leaked, which is very mm -hmm. unlikely, it could be toxic to your body, but you would know and then you could get them removed and it wouldn't be like tragic. I didn't realize until I just took them out that I got like the silicone gel, like they had, and maybe this was after it was banned and then they came back with this gel that was less likely yep, to yep. leak. So I knew there was like this 10 year expiry, but then I also knew people that had their implants in for 20 years. So I was like, sure. oh, please skirt by for a couple of years, you're gonna be fine. Then I had a child and then I breastfed and thank God I was still able to breastfeed. That was my biggest worry. But after you breastfeed, you lose a lot of tissue. So then I started to feel in the last couple of years, I started to feel the implants in me, even though they're small, but I had, I could feel, and I was like, okay, I got to get them out. And then I saw your, your story and your, and I was like, okay, I'm ready to do this. Let's do this. Good job. Listening to your intuition. Um, because I feel like it does have to resonate. So let's go back to, let's go back to a couple of concepts here. You wanted to feel like more of a woman and you wanted to be proportionate. So what does woman mean? Why do we have an image of woman a certain way? And what is proportions even? Where do we get that idea? Like, let's unpack like the, 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 the driving force behind it that not only you, but like so many others, me too. I mean, I remember afterwards, I was like, oh, I mean, I even said it in the interview last night. I was like, I didn't have to buy anything new other than bras. I was like, sports bras still fit, clothes still fit. I just felt like I was obviously more proportionate and I it like fit my body. So let's talk about like first woman. Just explain when you said I want to feel like more like a woman. Were there Was there a look or was it like scenarios? Was it with a guy? Like what, what did woman mean? Yeah, I mean, I think I grew up in the Victoria's Secret age, you know, we had I I, I was I'm born in 1979. So in the 80s and early 90s, it was like, the supermodels were all kind of Victoria's Secret models. That song? Have you heard that song? The Victoria's Secret song? I don't think so. Oh, my God, you have to hear the Victoria's Secret song. It's basically saying Victoria was made up by a dude, on, dude in Ohio. Les Wexman is made up by a dude in Ohio. There, She's not real. <laughs> and I was like, oh, my God, that's so true. <laughs> so true. Exactly. So it's this unrealistic I ideal of the woman that, you know, every guy, you know, and Playboy, that kind of pinup proportion never appealed to me but like the bikini model svelte but still curvy some of it was natural some of it was not many much of it was airbrushed so again unrealistic and that was just what i grew up thinking was the ideal for men you know and then when you are in your late 20s early 30s and you know things aren't working out and in love or acting, you just like want to make a change. And you're like, well, this is the problem. This is the one area I'm not proportionate, you know, or whatever. It's it's so silly to look back on now. But but at the same time, like I have a I have a relative who is six foot two and female. And she's always been super skinny, super tall. Um, she's been happily married for many years to a man much shorter than her. But she's just always been self-conscious about her body. And recently she got implants and it's like brought her out of her shell. So like, mm -hmm. I don't know, like, again, it's the reason she was in a shell is because she's comparing herself to some unrealistic ideal. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's like they've done so much good for her until they don't. So, okay, the underlying problem being not feeling like 
woman, not proportionate, not being, not being tall, but not having, you know, boobs or whatever it was and helping her feel, feel the same way, womanly proportionate. Is that the answer? Do you think like, I guess what I'm saying is when I got them, I wanted to feel more womanly as well. And when I, like when a guy grabs it, there ain't nothing there. Okay. And then I was like, ah, and then they felt them. And I was like, oh my God, now I just think about the fact that they're fake. Like it didn't even work. And, you know, then they, they come out and I still feel, you still have reasons for to feel insecure. If it's not my boobs, it's my butt. If it's not my butt, it's my abs. If it's not my abs, it's my legs. Like it just found another place to be unhappy. I, I mean, that's what I found. So, you know, like systemically, I feel like it's more of a root cause. So do you feel like it solved your problems or do you feel like it just transferred? A hundred percent it just transfers, you know, and it's, it's and and this is the journey that I'm on. This is a journey I think we all are on is to to get to a place where we can fully accept every aspect of ourselves and our psyche. And now, I mean, I love having them out. Like you said, like you wanted, you wanted to be more womanly and proportionate. But then, when there was actual intimacy and interaction with them, you're like, oh, I hope they <laughs> I implant, you know. And I've like made sure I did like the doctor. Like after you get implants in, you're supposed to like move them so they don't get hard <laughs> and get encapsulated. And so I did like twice as much. I was like, forget the pain. <laughs> like I'm making these girls natural, you know. But you're still self-conscious when with intimacy because you're like there's and you're like there's going to be a little bit of a because you know they're not real. Again, it's the journey. It's where you are. And I'm so I I heard your story and you were immediately felt clearer and a lot of your symptoms went away just removing them from your body. But energetically, too, I just feel like lighter and more myself. However, I have. Because I did a lift because I got mm-hmm. breastfeeding or mm-hmm. hanging real low. So I did a, like a little lift. So I have this vertical scar now. And you just look and I'm just looking in the mirror and they're, I'm like so happy with them out. And I'm so happy with them being small and perky. But now I have a scar that's just like, oh, God, the brutality that we put ourselves through is so yeah. nuts. It's true. Okay. Well, let's talk about the surgery itself because I know that there was like, uh, a pretty big discovery in getting them out. So, you know, you decided to to get them out. It was time. I think we talked about it. It, it energetic. Maybe share if there was symptoms or not, and just kind of like what ended up kind of tipping the scales for you. There was never any acute symptoms that I think that you were experiencing. But again, we adapt to so much. Like Lord knows where my brain fog came from, or. Just normal things that I I normalized in life. Um, not it, there's a million symptoms that could have been attributed to them. I had gotten I'd never gotten a mammogram in my life. Um, for some mm-hmm. reason they just never appealed to me. And then I researched them, and the effective to risk wasn't didn't resonate with me. So luckily I found this guy who has this really amazing. Um, it's called Sonacine, Dr. Kevin Kelly out of Pasadena. He just retired, but He's taught other people in this technology. So it's a it's a really high-tech ultrasound that can detect early cancers, much more mm. effective than and safe, non um, no radiation, than a mammogram. So I'd been going to him for a few years. And um, so I went to one of his colleagues, and she was like, you know, I think that there's some ruptures in the right one. And... She said, but they weren't major, but she was like, they they detected some rupturing. And she's like, I think, I really think that you should consider removing these. Like it's 12 years. I, yeah. this one's got ruptures. And I was like, that's so interesting. And I had noticed, and I don't know when it started. Sorry, I keep grabbing my boobs. Um, but when I, <laughs> maybe during COVID or maybe it was from breastfeeding, but when I started lying down a couple years ago, the right one would like, the left one would fall naturally and the right one would kind of just chill. When I felt them, they were soft. But then the, when I laid down, it was felt like encapsulated. Ah, like it stuck. I mean, like maybe it was stuck, stuck to the stuck to the the, the rib cage or something like yes. that. Yeah, and it was weird because I would be lying there and like one's here and one's just look. So that felt odd. Um, and then when she said there was ruptures, I was like, oh, that makes sense. So I just and then you were telling your story. I was like, oh, I need to get these out. I'm ready. It was this just kind of turn of events where my girlfriend told me about this doctor in New York, and I happened to be in New York and. I went to see him and I thought I was going to see like about like 
some natural Botox, because that's about as much as I do. He was like, no, I'm a neck down surgeon. I do a lot of like mommy makeover stuff. I was like, well, why am I here? You know, because she does, he did her Botox, but only a few people. And and I was like, oh, well, while I'm here, I want to get my implants out. I didn't do, I just trusted oh. that I was there for a reason. He got me in yeah. relatively quickly, um, you know, after a month of like pre-op checkouts and all that stuff. And um, it all went from there. But what he discovered as he opened me up uh, is that this one had fully ruptured, the right one. And we actually did it near Halloween and he posted it on his thing. It was like yellow, like I mean, when you sent me pictures of that, I was like, I think to myself, truly, I drove 200 miles an hour and hit walls. And I literally had one checked in an MRI like in 2018, because it was hard. And I thought maybe it's ruptured and everything was fine. So I'm like, how does this happen? Like, how does the silicone just sort of like fail? As we know, transdermal works. So like your scar tissue is still seeping and leaching. Like there's no way it's not a, it's not concrete, you know? So that's a, did the doctor say that that was a really dangerous situation? He was basically just like, I haven't seen this in five years. And then, you know, I was grateful that my body encapsulated it. But like you said, you know, there's still stuff that's happening, you know, and I don't, I didn't even ask him about mold, you know, what, what was going on there. If it's, if it's ruptured, like Lord knows what's seeping through my body. So I definitely want to do um, some sort of like detox and cleansing protocol. Just do some testing. Then when, that way, you know, I mean. Sometimes people test things and they're totally fine. And that hopefully is the case. But yeah, those tests are really easy. It was a godsend. And I don't know how my, my body did it. My body protected me. My body is so intelligent. But Lord knows how that thing ruptured. I mean, what, like, was it the pressure of breath, the breast milk? I don't, I don't know. What have you noticed after? Have you noticed anything or, or is it more just like, uh, you know, what, what have you enjoyed about it? If you like symptom wise, I'm curious, but then also just like, energetically, you know, where were you at and what were you feeling needed to shift? And then what are the little things that you notice now that you're like, oh my God, that's great. Yeah. I just feel there's just like a lightness of being and a back to myself. So mm. it's just a lighter load. And, you know, I've had like upper right shoulder neck problems, which is the side that had ruptured. Um, so I think there was a lot of like muscle tension that was also like protecting me too. So that I think is going to be able to release more and more, which, and that's been just chronic for years, you know, probably enhanced by the implant. So, um, I mean, that alone is a game changer of quality of life because that's, it's a constant, like, I feel like I have a bag of rocks on my, on my back. Mm -hmm. So I think that that is all able to unwind and, and I just feel like, I don't know, I just feel like I can open my heart more, you know, even Again, like you want to be more proportionate, you want to be more womanly, but then you subconsciously know that there's some inauthenticity here. So you kind of like hunch, you kind of, you don't, you know, mm -hmm. you, you don't, at least I didn't, I was a little bit like protective too of being too womanly, you know, it's like you can never hit it just right. So uh, just having that whole narrative and whole thing gone and it's a journey. I don't like beat myself up. I don't, it's like, that's where I was at. 12 years mm -hmm. ago, here I am today. And and I also think it's so interesting too, as we see there's just different, I think it's just like also not to name any like celebrity families or anything, but like a lot of people are getting butt implants and boobs and lips and- Can you imagine sitting on implants? I mean, I'd lay down in yoga or for a massage and I'd lay down and I'd be like, ah, these things are annoying. And they were 200 cc's. Can you imagine sitting your ass down with ass implants? I just can't. I can't. I've just always thought the goal was to get a smaller ass. I agree. I go into the gym and I'm like, I don't want a bigger butt. Okay. I don't, I don't want a bigger butt. I know. So hamstrings it is. But there is a whole culture that likes a bigger butt. And those women thought that that was more womanly. You know, I just, I don't know. I don't know. So Barbie proportions, not to call anyone out that there was a picture of like Barbie and someone and like how the body was shaped the same. And I'm like, it's not fucking real. But I think that there's an unwinding of that now too. And people are going back to a more, I don't know, this certainly feels right for me. And I'm just also at a different place in my life where I'm more 
about who am I authentically and less searching for any sort of feedback or validation from the outside world and more just like, what makes me feel good? What do I want to express? You know, and it took me 43 years to get to this point. Um, and you have to just go along the way. So that was just part of the journey. Talk about the work that got you there, because, you know, when we talked before about this, you know, energetically, you just said, I'm just not there anymore. Like, I just don't care. And it doesn't match my idea of health and well-being and the things that I stand for and believe in. And like, I've just moved on past that needing that. So like, what was the work that you've done? Like, what have been the most significant things you've done that have got you to a place where you could confidently take them out and be glad? Like, that's the that's the feeling I get from you is you're like super thrilled. I'm super thrilled. And, and there's a point in time when we wouldn't have been and we wanted them. And there's a place where people have them that should be getting them out that's scared that they won't look OK. And so talk about that work, because you are, you know, just one of my dear friends that really does the work. And I'm curious what that is, because for people listening, um, you know, I think that would be really helpful. Thank you. Um, it's constant work and it's constant changing. And I'm like going back and and reading things that I read 10 years ago that changed my life. I'm reading The Untethered Soul. Oh, yeah. I'm reading it now as if I'm reading it for the first time. And I'm just like, oh, my gosh, like this is the gateway to freedom. And even like. Return to Love, which Marianne Williamson wrote. And that was like my first, one of my first massive like openings to my spiritual journey when I was 19 years old. Someone in Australia gave me the book and I read it on the airplane home and I was like, oh my gosh, this is everything. Gateway to Love. Return to Love. So Untethered Soul, Return to Love, which of course, it's so beautiful to reread them because as Sadhguru told me, you know, like when I was interviewing him about his book, Karma, he's like, every time you read this, it'll be a different book. Because basically, when we change, the things we see change. Like, yeah. that's just how it goes. So amazing. And I love that. Michael Beckwith is one of my biggest spiritual teachers. And I'm actually going to be on his podcast later today, um, which is full circle and wild. You know, he talks about like, he's just a channeler of spirit. And he'll read, you know, books about all the masters and use them in his sermons and teachings and he'll he'll have like some sort of divine channeling and he'll be like I, I read this book this passage in this book and then he goes that morning and he just like pontificates about it and and just gives this fire and then he goes back to find that passage and it just it was never even there oh my because his interpretation of it was being like orchestrated by some perception and then when you go to find it the words are not basically arranged the same or like you aren't arranged the same. So the words aren't the same. Correct. Correct. And and there's one thing that I think Deepak told me, but I think it was an ancient saying, but it's um, a man can never step into the same river twice because it's not the same man and it's not the same river. So I just I just feel like all of the work I've done is just it's constant. Um, it has to be for me because even if I'm like constantly doing the work, I mean, I'm raising it and trying to rain, doing my best <laughs> to raise a three and a half year old yeah. child. So I'm trying to like learn about conscious parenting, which is really all about reparenting myself because our parents didn't really have the tools to parent us consciously. So, and then at the same time, I'm like interacting with my parents. And the other night, like I exploded at my dad mm. and I felt like so therapeutic for finally getting so much off my chest in a late night, post-stress, burnt out manner. It was not conscious at all. Um, and my poor dad was like devastated and hurt. And I felt like, oh, finally I've unleashed this, you know, this my use my voice, right, of all this pent up frustration of years. And I felt like fantastic. And then he's just, you know, devastated and hurt. So then we had a nice, beautiful healing conversation the next day. Oh, great. Such a nice catalyst though, you know? Yeah. 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 And, but it's like life is going to continue to just throw us triggers until we, all the stuff comes up to the surface. And I feel like collectively we are in such a pressure cooker right now that we, we need to lean into the work because all like the, fr I just, 
it has to be a frequency thing, you know? We started to learn about like how the frequency of or the Earth's magnetic field like was changing in 2012. Human resonance. Yes. And and I'm yeah. feeling that. And I'm feeling that the world is feeling that. And I'm feeling that there's been certain catalysts like Trump and others who are inciting all this shit that's been under the rug and in our shadows and and it's just all coming up to the surface to be seen, to be healed, to be dealt with. And yeah. it's gnarly and it's chaotic and it's really overwhelming for people and it's heartbreaking that just we don't have the tools to manage it. So like even I have – I feel like I have so much tools and I've been doing the work for so long and I'm still freaking overwhelmed and just like holding on for dear life right now. Mm -hmm. What is your perspective of it? Do you feel like it's the best or the worst time ever? Do you feel like this is the best thing that ever happened or worst thing that ever happened? Like the last few years have just been – well, a lot in a lot of ways, but there's been so much duality. There's been like, you know, things being brought to light, but then there's also like so much darkness being seen. So like, how do you choose to, where do you put your energy? Well, I get emotionally hooked and I'm like, this is the like darkest time. I think, hang on, back up because I think this would be really valuable because you and I are a little different in the way that we feel energy and, and what we feel. So like maybe explain, because I think this is also enlightening for people to understand how empathy and transference of, of energy works with people. So, you know, how are you feeling it and what do other people feel? Because I know you've gone down into this, you know, understand all this. So explain to people because there's a lot of different people out there. What I'm feeling is like, like I'm watching a very bad movie and I'm feeling and I'm trying to pull back and like be an observer and not get too sucked in by the movie because that's when we feel helpless and hopeless. Um, and I, but I also feel as I'm able to like step back and observe, I mean, Again, I feel like we're in this big drama and that's part of being a human, you know, that's part of this human experience of being in these flesh suits. Um, we're, we're spiritual beings having a physical experience and this time in history, this, which again, if we're going to get into that deep talk, it's like time is not linear, you know, like, so there's like holographic parallel dimensions or realities going universes. on. Universes. Uses. Yes, uses, exactly. So, you know, I, I have to try and stay in that mindset. But when I get hooked into the, the drama, what I'm seeing is like kind of all the things that have been defining beauty and what it means to be a woman, all of these type things, um, greed, patriarchy, all of these things that have been in power and control for so long, they're just, they're breaking down because again, as frequency and energy is rising, there's just a new paradigm that's being called for. Um, and there's a rebalancing, you know, and, and I don't know, like some people say like that we have 60 harvests left before the next extinction, you know, and maybe that's true. I don't, I don't know any of that stuff. I just know that like, you know, on the human level, this person that I don't know personally, um, the guy Twitch, Sir Twitch a lot, he was Ellen's DJ. I like followed him and his family randomly during COVID. They've got three point something million followers. And it was just these this cute couple that like choreographed these dances with their adorable kids, seemingly the most joyful person on the planet, just committed suicide a couple days ago. And I was like, it just brings me back to the human element of compassion. Like you could have everything and life is so gnarly and overwhelming right now from a certain perspective that you're just heart, your heart breaks for people. I mean, I had the flu two days ago and, and I hate the flu. I haven't had the flu for in a decade or so. And my body felt like I got hit by a truck, you know, it was brutal. And I have the resources and the privilege to call someone to come give me an IV. I have an amazing doctor who like is 
you know, I have, I was prepared with all the holistic things. I battle, like I started on it all right away. I'm taking like baking soda and Epsom salt baths. I have the luxury of a nanny who, even though she wasn't booked, like lives 20 minutes away and said, I'll come in and I'll sleep with your child so you can rest. Like I have the luxury. I'm like, I feel so shitty. I'm so tired for people that can't afford help or don't have anyone to help. They have to work. They have to survive and battle the flu or battle chronic illness. Like when that, like it just gave me such compassion for the world. Like I don't know how people are surviving right now. I have all the support in the world and it was a fucking struggle for me, you know? So I just go, I oscillate through this like observation of just like, okay, we're in this massive drama right now. And this is great fodder for growth and transformation and like getting me aligned with what my work here is on the planet. And then I get pulled into this just like, fuck, dude, it's hard for people. You feel so deeply like that's one of the most beautiful things about you is how you are able to really understand the pain that people are going through. Um, You know, your empathy is off the charts in so many great ways, but it's overwhelming to you. And so like, I just want to give you a hug because like, I know how, I know how heavy that all feels and it's part of your work too. And why you made the documentary heal, which is how we ended up meeting. Cause I saw it and why you do the podcast and why you, why you do so many things to try and just get people to wake up to themselves, to the world, to other options, other ways of thinking. So like if, you know, what, what's the remedy? What's the remedy for a situation like Twitch? What I, we don't know his story. All it looked like is that he was super happy and dancing and had kids and a family. Like what is the remedy for situations like that, where someone is essentially so alone in their experience? Like what can we do and what does culture need to welcome in and usher in so that that is not the result from that we that we that we witness yeah i mean for me what i'm feeling the remedy is is like right now i feel like anything that causes pressure I, you know they had such a like i mean he had a successful career and then covid hit and then he and his wife had this like successful instagram and God, mm-hmm. I can't even speak to I, – I should just even stop speaking because I have no idea what was going on behind behind closed doors. But I just know okay. that with social media and instantaneous information overload, like there's just this pressure to do. We're seeing other people be so productive, this many likes, this many followers, these partnerships, making money, whatever it is. And we feel that's available to us and then we feel like failures when we can't do it. Like there's just too much pressure on us right now and I think that like the what I'm craving is like like this flu actually kick-started I'm really craving just like a detox and a cleanse and like a and and this is kind of what nature intends us to do every winter is it is a cocooning you know a quieting it's like the winter solstice it's dark it wants you to like just be Mm -hmm. in your cozy home be with yourself, be with solitude and 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 reconnect with who you are and and get you prepared for the year to come. And that's my remedy is just is just like disconnecting a little bit from the pressures of the social media from the information overload. And I do feel like eventually kind of like how this, you know, a lot of people are are getting explant surgery and a lot of people are are being more natural and authentic. A lot of people are moving um, and buying farms and growing their own food and <laughs> creating their own local communities. Um, mm-hmm. I do think that there is going to be a correction of this digital addiction that's killing so many of us. Um, and we're going to disconnect and reconnect to nature and reconnect to each other. So I think that's a massive part of the remedy that's going to happen naturally as a natural evolution. Um, But individually, I think that we all need to just remove that pressure by disconnecting, reconnecting to ourselves, reconnecting to nature. And then the other and then like really the other part of it, the work that I'm doing right now through untethering of the soul and all these, you know, other books that I'm reading, like is just learning how to fully accept ourselves and the shadow parts of ourselves. Because I find that this cancel culture and this polarization 
that's happening because of social media and because of this political climate and a broken system of our government, um, that we live in fear of making a mistake or saying the wrong thing and getting canceled. It's like, yeah, there's mistakes that need consequences for sure that are just horrific and can't exist in, in a healthy society. But then there's mistakes and things that people do and and like we have to be allowed to make mistakes and we have to understand that everybody's human and like you cannot condemn and yell and hate and um, whether on social media or, or, or not, like n nobody's perfect. We're all human. We've all made mistakes and we're not allowing when we're condemning someone else. It's because we're really condemning that part of ourselves that we haven't accepted yet. That's down there that we're just like pushing down and denying and spending a lot of energy and getting depressed and anxious and burnt out because of. So I think that's the remedy is really looking to the parts of ourselves, like using triggers to as flags to go, oh, that's a part of me that I haven't accepted yet. Or that's a wound that I have that I haven't healed yet. And so using anything, any person in our family, any situation in the world, using it as feedback so that we can turn to the part of ourselves that we're condemning, denying, rejecting, or haven't looked at because it was a painful wound that we haven't, that happened years ago that we haven't addressed. So true. So true. It's always an inside job. And our reality is just showing us us the whole time because you might react to something at something going on in the world where it doesn't it doesn't register for me it's not a wound it's not something i think about and vice versa so what's the process of that work because for the people listening whether it's you know um being triggered by you know looks and appearance of people on social and it reflecting on like they all they're thinking is like mm, they think something negative or negative about themselves or whether it's a relationship and somebody does something you don't agree with it like there's so much what what is it that is creating so much division and judgment and then what's the process like what's that process look like when something comes up for you as a trigger what do you do great question still trying to figure that out myself um, we on? <laughs> I try to breathe in the untethered soul where it's talking about like rather than getting hooked by the psyche because we're trying to get our mind to control like the outside circumstances. I don't know. He puts it so much more eloquently. I think that was protecting us. Like we have patterns that establish us in a ch in childhood and they're irrational as we get older because we don't need the same things we needed. Like we're going to have food, we're going to have shelter, hopefully, or, or generally speaking, we're lucky enough to be in that situation. So like things aren't actually a threat, but we still re we still bounce back to the original wound when it was a threat. So Things are things are not accurately judged as we get older. And so our ego's job is just protect, protect, protect. Make sure that we don't get exposed to something that would hurt us deeply like it did the first time. And so it just, that's all it does. But it's only thinking about right now. It's not thinking about next year. It's not thinking about 10 years from now. So the ego wants to be satisfied like immediately to protect you. And it just doesn't have the long game in mind. So we just flip out on things because that's that's because right now that is the best solution to negate against that original wound exactly and the simplest the simplest uh i guess exercise and and again it might take many many times of practicing to then diminish one trigger or one wound um one wounding so yes. is is to realize that we are we are not our thoughts we are not our mind we are the observe. We, we are the consciousness, the soul, the um, the the observer. We can we can sit back and observe our neurotic thoughts and mind and emotions. And so we are the observer. We are not our thoughts. Mm -hmm. So when we get hooked by a thought, when we get mad at someone for betraying us, or um, or if we feel this emotion in our heart that starts tightening, uh, you know that should like once we start to practice awareness, we go oh. There's a change here. Oh, there's a trigger. And then we start to pull back and go, what is it? Rather than get hooked by it. And then we're in the drama and then we want to kill the person and, or, you know, we want to be the victim. Woe is me. And so 
it's just starting to tune in like, oh, when I start to feel the constriction, when I start to hold my breath, when I start to get angry. <sighs> okay, something's happening here and and step back and observe. And the, oh, the more you, you know, sometimes it'll come after 20 minutes of being in it. That's the th that's what I always ask people. I'm like, okay, I love the observer. It's great and all, except for it's it, the triggers are still real. And like, how do I not get caught in the trigger in that moment? Like, what is the actual access point that or, like corrects this pattern of being triggered? It's it's very nuanced and tough. Different ones are gonna hook you for yeah. days before you go. Oh, I don't want to feel this way anymore, you know. And the more you can then go you know, I don't want to feel this way anymore. And you start to just, you pull back and you observe and you start to explore, like, where is this coming from? Or this is what I'm trying to do. Like, you know, like, oh, I'm so angry at my dad. And then, and then I'm starting to realize, why is it so hard for me to apologize? Why is it so uncomfortable for me? You know, and then observing that and then say, okay, what's more important for me to, to be right or to be loving, you know, to be right or to have a relationship with my father. Sorry, I always bring my dad into this, this poor guy. Mine too. I always bring my dad into it. It's usually my dad. But now my mom gets in there too. And I'm like, oh shit, sorry, mom and dad. Like, mm, it's part of my, it's part of my story. I know. It's part of all of our story. Every parent will make every, you're either going to love or you're, you're going to love your kid too much or too little. It's like, you can't get it right. And it's part of the journey of being human. There's just a certain amount of trials, tribulations, and suffering that's, I think, in, uh, is just um, part of being human. So. so, And it's made us who we are, and that's part of it. It's like, you know, the goal the goal is to be free of the suffering, the free of the, 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 the triggers hooking us and, and pulling us into the drama. The, the more freedom and expansion we have, despite what's happening around us, because there's so much out of our control, then we have a little bit more like lightness of being and um, freedom in life to, you know, not get hooked by all the minutia that's happening in the world. Um, mm. and then to be able to stand in an expanded space and lend people a hand or, you know, go on adventures and do things we were put on earth to do. Um, <laughs> so it's just, it's, it's such a priority for me that I want to practice it every day. And some days I fail miserably because I haven't slept not eating well, I'm drinking too much, whatever it is, it mm. all interacts. Like when my vessel, like I just had the flu for two days, you know, which detox my body <laughs> in every way, couldn't eat, you know. And then now I'm feeling crystal clear. I've rested. Thank God I was able to rest. And now my vessel is like clear, strong. It was like a reset button. But if so I have a little bit more space to show up in the world and like do the work, you know, but when I'm burnt out, when I'm stressed out, when I'm not eating right, when I'm not, when my physical vessel is not optimally running, it's mm -hmm. way harder to mentally and emotionally like step back and observe. It's just, you get hooked. And that's the other thing. It's like, we've got to prioritize taking care of our vessel so that we can show up spiritually and do the work. Right. Why do you think it's so hard for so many of us to take care of ourselves first and stay in integrity? Why is it that, why is that so difficult? Again, roles that we've been programmed with in society. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I sometimes put, even if I'm like burnt out, whatever, I put my partner's needs first because he's the, you know, he's making money. So I've always like put my work second, my well-being second, um, you know, and I'm starting to take a little bit more ownership of like, I can show up much more powerfully for my family if I put my needs first. So I've been, I've started to like realize how important that is. Um, and I'm observing it in other people around me as they're starting to like establish new boundaries because they're realizing that. Because you have boundaries. You're teaching people how to take care of you by showing them how you take care of yourself. Yes. Respectfully. Modeling for my daughter that we, mothers, women, anyone, male, female, anyone, like if you you have to prioritize, not at the expense, obviously, the child's needs are first and foremost at all times, but um, for her to witness me saying, I really need to, to go meditate right now, 
or mom, I need to, I need to work out. I need to move my body. I need to like flush out some frustration, whatever it is. Like she's now going, oh, these things are important, you know? And of course it's a balance. Um, her needs are a priority, but uh, she sees she sees that I take care of myself, and I and, and I explain to her why I need to do that. So um, I'm getting better at it. But again, programming societal roles, you know, mm-hmm. in the home, it's like just moms are and women in general are just I don't know. They're just there's more demanded from them on the nurturing side. And then like <laughs> I'm sick, and I'm like, but you're like what? Nobody cares about me. What's happening? You know, what about this? Uh, I found something that's really helpful is this sort of forgiveness is forgiveness to yourself. But I like the self. I mean, we, we were we were sort of talking about that of interesting things that we could talk about. And forgiveness is one of those things that came up. So, you know, um, why why is it so hard to forgive ourselves? And why do we not even know that we need to? Like, I think that's even a thing like. I don't know. Do I need to forgive myself for anything? And and there's such power in that, you know. Have you realized that there's anything you need to forgive yourself for? And what was the what was what what was the feeling? Why? When? What happened after? I just think that, like, I mean, every day, if I make a mis- like, if I feel like I'm not, if I'm again not taking care of myself, and then I'm short with my daughter, I'm going to lose my temper with my daughter, I'm gonna blow up at my dad, like these little things we need to forgive ourselves for. We can't, me, like, I want to be perfect. You know, I've, I've even just what's coming to mind is like growing up as an actor, you audition for something and you fail so many times, you get rejected time after time after time. And I didn't forgive myself in those moments. I rejected myself. I beat myself up. I criticized myself. I'm like, you're, you know, I'm, I've put in so much effort and I'm getting so little return. And I'm like, oh, I'm a failure. I'm wasting my 20s. Da, da, da. Like, I'm not forgiving. I, I needed to forgive myself in those moments. I needed to realize that like, so it's, it's an energy of like releasing the pressure off the valve. And then you show up in the world a lot more confident, present, loose, and people then want to hire you, whether you're an actor or a plumber or anything else. It's like when we're so punishing ourselves over and over for little things that don't even matter to the rest of the world. Of course, bigger things when you hurt someone or you, again, because you haven't taken care of yourself, so you've reacted to something, you've let a trigger get the best of you, or you make a mistake, you make bad judgment. Um, You know, I just feel like we need to be given we need to be taught how to forgive ourselves and how important it is. And I feel like that's why we are in the state we are today of this cancel culture, because we beat ourselves up so much and we hold ourselves to this impossible standard that like, we have to beat other people up and condemn other people because, again, there's this like pressure valve of all these things we're stuffing down that we haven't accepted and we've been hiding because we're so ashamed and we haven't forgiven ourselves, even though, again, in the grand scheme of things, they're little things or they're things that we thought were so massive in childhood um, that were so devastating and life-changing. It was like not a big thing, but held it down, turned the valve long enough, those things fester, those things get moldy, those things get compounded. Mm -hmm. And so all of that to say, I think we need to learn to forgive ourselves in the moment so that we don't suppress so much shame and guilt. Mm-hmm. And and as we learn to do that to ourselves, I think we're going to live and see and experience a much more forgiving, not cancel culture society and reality. We're treating ourselves that way, which inevitably means we treat others that way. Like what we judge in ourselves, we judge in others. So forgiveness for ourself is, is the way to start with it. And um, I think that would be a really powerful tool to transform so many things going on. Um, I mean, you know, let's talk a little bit about like masculine, feminine. I feel like I'm always on this topic. I'm very curious about that. You know, when we're talking about forgiveness, like, you know, there's some, I interview a lot of guys these days and I'm really curious about this patriarchy sort of theme. I'm curious about the masculine, feminine, 
like I'm thinking, do we forgive men for being in power? Like, what does that look like? And how, how do we, how do we forgive ourselves for not standing? I mean, there's also an equal, an opposite, like we should forgive ourselves for not standing up for ourselves in the past. Right. So what, what needs to come into balance the masculine, the ma- I'm just going to use man and woman from the men, male side and the female side. What do you think needs to be rectified? Because again, when we're turning the turning the fingers back on ourselves as the the way that things move forward, and we are talking about forgiveness, another one is unite. I think another powerful tool to uh, balancing things out is this uniting of the masculine and feminine within us. So what do you think is out of balance when we're looking at, generally speaking, men and women? Uh, in society, the systems, in for sh- like just the systems of society are out of balance because they are very masculine <laughs> leaning. In you know? what way? Like in the way that they, in who runs them or like how it is run? Both, both. I think greed and capitalism and is very like a masculine um at the expense of, I, I mean, maybe it's not, but I think it is, like at the expense of the earth and resources and maybe life, like human life in, in getting a product made and increasing profit margins and, you know, enslaving oh, yeah. children or raping the earth of its minerals or, you know, releasing lots of toxic stuff into the air or into our food and all of this stuff. I feel like that's not a feminine thing to do, not a nurturing thing to do. Um, so I think just like, there's a lot, I mean, there's obviously so much I'm grateful for about capitalism, but then the imbalances that were the greed and the, um, lobbying that happens and the buying of politicians and then they have to keep up like, I mean, that's a whole rabbit hole we got to go down. But so I think, I think the, 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 the domination of men in power that's obviously been enabled by a system that is created by men in power for, I don't know when that started. It's been eons, right? Feel that the new paradigm is like, we need to go back to that. Ner- There's a renaturing that has to happen. The, the masculine patriarchy driven, um, system that we're living in has disconnected us from nature and Mm. it's called mother nature because it's feminine like so we Mm. are genetically modifying our food we are genetically modifying our dna (laughs) at this point we are um we are in addicted to screens and not out in nature like we we're we're denaturing mm-hmm. ourselves our food and our our and and then we're raping our planet so we're denaturing nature um so i think that part of the big rebalancing is bringing that feminine um approach and nurturing and love and holistic um realizing that everything's involved we can't like a conscientiousness a conscientiousness and a and a connection to nature and each other that's missing right now because of this kind of masculine profit at all costs. Bottom dollar. Bottom dollar. We've been denatured um, by greed and industry um, and this pressure, and we're seeing it in social media again, um, like win at all costs, get followers at all costs. And so now I think there's going to be um, you know, more females coming into power, into the current system before the system can change. Mm. And then also just a, as as individually we become more balanced, doing the work of feminine and masculine, doing mm-hmm. the forgiveness work, um, accepting ourselves, taking out our implants, <laughs> whatever it is, um, you know, then we'll see collectively, you know, Again, I just love this idea of like being more local, being more in community, and sure. and just that's that just feels more feminine and connected. What do you think a woman's superpower is? I know that one of them is bringing a freaking life into this world. And oh, I know yeah. that's not for every everybody, but we are like a portal for life. That's crazy. Actually, yeah, I did an interview and somebody was like, well, the the most straightforward portals, like a portal that you can create, like you can create, 
is like a child, a child's a portal. And I was like, oh my God, totally. I think love, our capacity to love and feel when shit goes down, lift a car off of a child, like the, 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 we all have that maternal instinct, whether we have children or not. We, we feel this, it's, it's our love. I think our superpower is love. And I mean, you are so like, you came in with so many gifts and you love racing, you know, you loved competing, you, but like your love for it drove you like your Mm -hmm. love for your curiosity is a version of love, you know, like you're, we're just, I think our superpower is love. I think that, um, we love our children. We love our friends. We love our girlfriends. We love our husbands. We love our wives. We love, we just love so greatly. And that cause that allows us to do very powerful things. What is it that a man needs to respect about a woman? And what is it a woman needs to respect about a man that's challenged right now that would bring us closer together? Man, I think that men need to respect women's intelligence more because I just feel like we have a a subtle intelligence. Like intuition. Like intuition. Like psychic abilities. And empathy that will make us I think some of the best leaders in the world. And I think we're starting to get that shot where we haven't in history as much, but I think the intelligence that women have is a much more complex intelligence. The different intelligence. The different the intelligence. Different intelligence. And I think that it can complement yeah. the intelligence and and what what men have been able to create. Um, but it's a different intelligence and it's time for that intelligence to step forward a little bit more. So if men, yeah. the smartest men will recognize that and tap into that. All right. Now you got to flip it. You got to, I'm, I'm like a really, like I have so much Libra in me. I'm like, well, there's the man, but there's the woman. Like if we're going to talk about the patriarchy, we're talking about matriarchy. So what is it that we need to respect and honor about men that is challenged right now that they do really well? What's coming up for me is their ability to survive like when shit goes down they step up i mean i know the men in my life do and mm-hmm. that is what i respect and admire again i'm getting emotional why am i getting emotional mm-hmm. i just feel like times are freaking tough right now mm-hmm. and what i see with the men in my life is they just they don't sit around they're not soft you know they're just like i'm gonna fucking figure it out excuse my french there's some french that needs to happen right now because times are tough for everybody and And it's all relative, but like the reason men are in power is because the burden's been on them to survive and keep the keep the the family unit protected in the wild. That's still in them, and that's thank God for men in that way, you know. And 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 again, just like you said, like we have these wounds as children um, that no longer are relevant. They're irrational at this point because we're bigger and more independent and can fend for ourselves. So we can let those go and and nature has changed like we live in these cities we're not fighting yeah. saber tooth tigers and and right. and warring tribes but there's still that instinct to survive and and that's to be honored and respected and and I'm grateful for that you know so it's kind of almost within what we need to love honor and respect about men categorically speaking masculine energy that is part of the problem it's the fact that let's say you need to survive so you need to go slay the dragon, get the meat, build the house, make the money is what's actually gotten out of control. Yes. And that it's come at the expense of too many other things now. And so I love, because I know this is so, I think this is what you're moving into is more around um, mother earth and like regenerative and what can we do to sort of connect back with nature again is that when we think about when we orient ourselves with what is best for the planet what is best for longevity what is best for keeping things the you know alive and well you you when we all do that we orient back to intuition taking care nurturing n- making different decisions from a conscientious standpoint about business. Look, I think of money as just energy and it's just energy. And like if one institution or paradigm falls, 
another is going to rise. Like it's just an energy. And like, we think of money as this sort of be all end all, but like skill and trade is going to be pretty freaking important when institutions of money collapse and there isn't anything in your bank anymore. So like there is a need for all of it. And, and it's just, you know, you won't need a hundred grand in the bank when you just need to like build a fire. So Exactly. You know, we need to get back to like, back to square one, back to, back to looking after longevity and nature and our nature in a more caring way. And that's exactly what's gotten out of balance. It's that like drive to survive and then you do so well that you're like, oh, but I don't want to lose what I have. And so this is this like masculinity, toxic masculinity on a hamster wheel that's gotten out of control. And that's where we are now. Um, and so as we, as we like more of this feminine leadership comes into power and, and, and more men are able to, um, just, it's, it's almost like women are in charge of taking care of the village and the family. So as we teach kind of the younger generations of men to then go, okay, we only thrive when the community, the, the village thrives. So we've been so, um, everybody's been so individualized and the politicians, it's like they started out with altruistic and a lot of them still have it, altruistic ideals. And that's why they got into this thankless job of politics. Uh, but then they got little self-interest perks along the way. And then it's grown into the snowball and they're believing their own lies to continue to survive because that's what they yeah. feel they need to survive. We're driven by fear, you know? Yeah. Well, when we're talking about survival, what's like becoming a little bit more clear in the spirit of this discussion about getting your implants out is that like if the sur if the surviving is uh, Donald Hoffman, I interviewed him, he's a brilliant guy. And it's like he believes that base reality is just consciousness and that essentially our purpose is to survive, like fitness is what he calls it. So now imagine that you're in now imagine that you're in your you're you're in the days of huts and getting the slaying the, the the deer for dinner or whatever it is. And like you survival of the species and of you, of you in some extended way also means having children, which means being chosen by a man to do that. So as time goes, somewhat of survival has been, well, if I want to be chosen, I need to look right. I need to be attractive to the male. I need them to want me because children is what keeps things going. Like survival and fitness is, is, is rooted there. So here we are now doing all kinds of things, which again, we might be looking at men and saying, you're going and destructing the planet because you're short-sighted. You have no conscientiousness. You, you don't care about what's going on with our soil. You don't care about our oceans. But then here we are as women going, I'm going to stick a bunch of foreign shit inside of me because my survival is short-sighted. And I go, I need C's at least <laughs> so that someone will like me so that I have fitness and survival for life to be chosen so that I can bear children, so that my genetics continue, so the planet continues. So we're not all that so I different. Let this man who's raping the planet protect me or whatever, you know, like exactly. You know, we're not protecting ourselves. So as much as men need to, as much as the masculine, I'm not trying to pigeonhole men and women and putting us at fault just as much is that, you know, they're going and surviving by making sure that there's food on the table, essentially. And we're making sure that we're survived by being chosen by going and mutilating our bodies in ways that we think is going to help that cause. But really it's going to do things like cause anxiety, depression. Uh, it's going to to make us have gut issues, hormonal issues. All these things are like a result of this poisoning that we're doing to ourselves. So we're, we're not that much different. Like it needs to be a coming to coming back to what's real and right, which is nature, which is what, how things were, were, were born and how, th where things came from, from, you know, this place of purity and we got to get ourselves pure, which means I'm probably gonna have to stop the Botox eventually. I know, but I'm not ready to yet. <laughs> I mean, I'm still waiting for that one to come out. That's, that's all I do, but I do, you know, I mean, trust me, if you could see how angry my face got, you might be like, no, you should probably keep that. Um, but as more information comes out, we learn. And so this is the forgiveness on that we have to have for ourselves, where we go, look, I was doing the best I could with the information I had. And it's, 
it's totally okay to course correct. And that's what's, that's just what's happening. Yeah. So let's finish off. What is your greatest lesson in 2022? Oh boy. Um, greatest lesson in 2022, I feel is we're all doing the best we can with what we know. And we're all subconsciously enabling and, and pushing this thing along until we don't, you know what I mean? So as, as each of us wake up to who we truly are, mm -hmm. that shifts and in each of us gets your Libra action and each of us work on on balancing the mac masculine and feminine which happens naturally we don't go oh I need to be a little bit more feminine today because you and I both are fire and oh yeah we have our masculine We've got a lot of masculine in us yeah um, so but again like as I just start to come closer to who I really am and do the work and start to look at my triggers as um as signs of what I need to look at. It's all, a, a, to me, it's just embracing who I really am, accepting those parts that I've been rejecting and denying and, and not facing, um, to fully embrace myself, to fully come mm -hmm. back into balance myself so that I can just energetically then be the change that I want to see in the world, you know? And so that's, I think, the lesson is like, we're all doing the best that we can with what we know. And I've got to do the work that I want to see in the world. And that's what I'm doing. And what I want to see in the world is that we all come back together, um, come back into balance and come back to nature. Um, and so that's what I'm trying to do in my everyday life. You're doing a great job. Congratulations. Thank you. Boobies. <laughs> <laughs> hug me exactly. hug me from hug me from head to toe aren't the hugs so much better like the hugs are so much better i didn't even expect that i'm hugging so much tighter people are like okay yeah I'm like not. the whole torso yes yeah heart to heart now yeah nothing, yeah. nothing foreign in between so yeah, yeah. Thank, you. Right. thank you thank you thank you thank you i'm so proud of you and i'm so grateful for you as a friend i love you <laughs> love you too Thanks everybody for listening to the Pretty Intense podcast today. I hope you enjoyed it. If you like what you heard today and you want to hear more, please click on the subscribe button.